Nine months ago, I left London on a bit of a whim. I found this little house and moved into the Swedish forest. This land is new to me, but it felt like the place I needed to be. I don't really leave this little plot of land much. Now that spring has begun, the trees have started to bloom and every day I discover something new. I'm looking forward to even warmer temperatures so I can walk around with bare feet. I bought this home using all of my savings and planned to renovate everything. It was old, partially rotten, with a leak in the roof. The water wasn't winterproof, but I was ready for a challenge in life. When I first arrived, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to make it work financially. I work as an interior designer and I'd been thinking about pursuing other creative ideas to earn money, but I left the city before I could figure out exactly what that could be. Nevertheless, I decided to not let these uncertainties hold me back from pursuing this fairy tale of renovating a cabin in the woods. So here I am in a rundown house in a country where I know no one without any renovation experience, trying to figure out how I could live here, live in these woods, make this cabin a home, and have enough money to live off. I know many of you are curious how you could make a life like this possible, so I thought I would share my story. This cabin, the starting price when it was listed was 295,000 crowns and I ended up paying a little bit more because there was a bidding war, there were a few people interested. I bought it with all of my savings and I had a little bit left over to live for a few months and start the renovations. I had it all saved up from my job, I don't have any investments, I didn't have a property to sell before I came here. They were actually savings that I'd put together from living in London and I intended to use them for a flat in London as a down payment. But I guess things turned out <laughs> a little differently. If you can save up for a down payment for a flat in a big city then you could come here and buy a little old house. I mean my background is very normal. I don't have any wealth or any connection to wealth. When I grew up we considered the one girl whose both parents worked to have money. So um, I think her parents were teachers so they weren't really rich. Um, but that's kind of my benchmark so there's no hidden treasures anywhere that allow me to to do this. My job in London had very average pay for being in the city but I've always had enough to to do the things that I want to do in life so I have a good relationship with money, I'm good at saving which definitely helps. <laughs> so I do go through periods where I make a little bit less money but I never worry about it because I know that I'll make money again in the future, so... I guess life is simple for me. I don't have a mortgage, I don't have any debts, I don't have a car, and I don't have anybody depending on me. So, yeah, my background is very normal. If anything were to happen, then my backup plan would be go back to London, <laughs> go back to work. <laughs> or worst case scenario, my parents have an attic that I could stay in. I mean, that's, that's it. So, my money's in the house. So, you know, if I had to, then I would sell the house and basically go back to London. Saving up money for a big purchase can seem so daunting and unreal, but having a tangible goal to work towards really helps. 
Most people would be able to save after making some lifestyle changes and stop spending on clothes, technology, dinner and drinks and this is something I did. These coming years is to spend as much time on the renovation so I'm trying to figure out how much I need to work to have enough money to live off to buy the materials and to also have time to actually do the renovation it's a balance that I need to get right. At the moment, I make a little bit of money doing YouTube, but my main job is as an interior designer. The great thing about working from home is that I can spend my lunch hours or mornings still doing some DIY on the house, and that makes a big difference. I had a look at my bank account, and so far I've spent about £6,000 on the renovations already. I don't know where all of this money went, but this includes materials, tools, some other miscellaneous items for the house. So far I've made a water pump house, I made it winterproof, fitted new ceiling and flooring joists, replaced flooring and ceiling and windows and walls. <laughs> I made a toilet room and I'm beginning to put in tongue and groove boards to the floors and walls throughout the cabin. I do still have a lot of materials left over which I bought before winter, um, but I am about to make a small order again for some of the summer projects. I decided I won't spend money on temporary items for the house. I barely have any furniture or storage, but my building plans include lots of built-in furniture, so I don't want to purchase anything I couldn't use after I'm done. I've been living in this one small, untouched room. The furniture in it is garden furniture left by the previous owner. The paint is chipping, the chair is broken, and it's most definitely rotting. <laughs> I have a shelving unit that I found in a shed and two single beds on top of each other which I bought so my parents had something decent to sleep on last year. I did invest in an armchair recently and this makes me so happy. It's a piece I will keep in the final interior and having something so comfortable has made me so happy. <laughs> Living in a small room has created a bit of a mess. Over winter I kept everything in here that shouldn't freeze because it's the only room I keep warm. So there's paint in the corner, all my food on the shelves, laundry I haven't done because I need to do everything by hand and the table has been covered in paperwork and receipts. I really wanted to make things a little bit more livable without spending money. So I decided to make these temporary shelves using materials I already had. The shelves will be used again in the kitchen so the wood isn't wasted. I did look at buying some black steel brackets but they were really expensive. And since I don't plan on keeping them in the final build, I used leftover fabric instead. I thought I was being quite clever, but I did a little bit more research and noticed that leather straps are widely sold for the same purpose. But it was a cheap solution for me and I'm really happy with the temporary storage. It makes such a difference to get some of the mess off the floor and off my desk and onto these shelves. I also added a little rod to hang up towels and clothes. I bought some cheap hooks from Ikea and the other straps and the hooks are actually for my future tent builds. Another big cost for me is food. I go to the supermarket once every week or 10 days. During winter I waited up to two weeks if the roads were slippery or covered in snow. 
It's a 12 km cycle ride, which takes a little bit longer during winter. Groceries are expensive. In London, I did look at prices, but mostly I was able to buy what I wanted. But here it's like going to Marks and Spencers every week, except you don't get Marks and Spencer products and it's even more expensive. I really do have to look at the prices and pick up the produce I can afford that week. I probably spend about £250 on groceries per month. I should say that I do eat healthy and quite a lot. <laughs> um, other people would probably be able to do with less. I also eat lots of vegetables and fruit and cheese and things get a lot more expensive when I start adding items like fish and olives. In the end, I think my spending is similar to being in London, but I definitely have to be more selective and opt for the cheaper options. I think one of the ways I'm managing to take on this project and live here without a full-time job is by not buying anything I don't really need. Last year, I bought some warmer clothing for winter. I got some kitchenware and plants and okay quite a few plants <laughs> I got a few lights but nothing you know excessive I mean obviously I do live here and I do want to be happy in this space you know it's a building site so I'm trying to make it a little bit nicer but yeah I'm just trying to be really careful so I decided to make some things myself instead of buying them I really want some summer dresses, so instead of going out shopping, I got some fabric <laughs> and I got some really nice fabrics. Look at these! I'm also planning on accessorizing the toilet room. This is a bit of a splurge, but I do want to make it look cute. One of the things that it really needs is a lampshade and I love lighting. There's so much good lighting around right now. But it's all very expensive, especially the things that I like. So I decided to make my own lampshade. <laughs> and this is going to be one of my um, very soon projects. I got all of these things from this store. I have these little like wire frames, knitwear, and I am going to get very creative. I'll be busy. I'm giving myself many more pro projects. So this is my cheap and cheerful solution to making the house nice and hopefully adding like a very personal touch to it. So I guess that covers renovation costs and food, but there's also bills. So I don't have any debts and I don't have a mortgage or rent to pay or a car. The house is partially off grid, you could say. Um, there's electricity, but that's it. And apart from that, I need to pay for taxes. I have private healthcare for a year, um, which I need to, to be able to register in Sweden. I have a storage unit in London, a small private pension, internet, and a few software subscriptions. So electricity is a huge expense. Obviously, everything in a house runs on electricity. 
I have the water pump. During winter I have the heating cable which is on all the time, which is about 250 watts I think. And obviously I have cooking on the little cooking stove. The water heater which is all electric. All I heat is the one room that I live in. Everything else, the kitchen and the other rooms remain cold during winter. So that's a very small amount of room. Um, but in December my electricity bill was still about 200 euros for one person heating one room. Um, yeah, that was that was excessive and slightly discouraging. But right now it's around a hundred and during summer it goes down to about 50. I guess all together, all of my expenses and food together are similar to the rent I was paying for a room in London. But taxes are a different story. Taxes are where the trouble starts down here. <laughs> Let's sit down for this. Taxes. Okay. Taxes in general, income tax is it's definitely higher than it is in the UK. But compared to lots of other European countries, it's quite similar. It's about 30 something percent for as like the lowest tax bracket. That's okay. The biggest issue is your tax-free allowance. In the UK, the, your tax-free amount is £12,500, which I think completely makes sense because it allows you to pay for shelter, to pay for at least a room and your food before you start paying tax. Down here in Sweden, my tax-free allowance is about £2,800, which is insanely low. <laughs> um, and it means that essentially I will have to get a job not just to pay for my food, but to pay for my taxes. Yeah, so that's, that is what it is. But there's another thing that makes it a little bit more difficult for freelancers in Sweden is the social securities. In the UK, I end up paying about 20% in taxes and social securities and that's it. If I have a year where I don't make much money because I'm traveling a lot, then I barely pay taxes because of the high tax-free allowance. Here, obviously, that allowance is a lot lower but the social securities if you're employed your employer looks after social securities and you will never notice that they look after that it's not counted as part of your income after my tax-free allowance despite being on like the lowest tax bracket i pay a little bit more than 50 percent in income tax and social securities so that's a lot <laughs> I feel like this country is set up really well if you are happy to lead a more traditional life. If you, you know, if you're born here, you go to school, you go to university, which I think is free, and you get married and have children, your children, you will benefit from maternity care, paternity care, child care, <laughs> again, university for your children and all of that is really well <laughs> arranged but once you don't really fit in that mold you realize that you're in you know essentially paying for things that you don't benefit from obviously you're never going to benefit from everything directly but it makes me actually appreciate the system in the uk a little bit more because it gives you the choice for example our pension in the UK, the state pension is quite bad, but knowing this now, I realise that I have the choice in the UK to allow for a minimal pension, which may be good enough for certain people in certain situations, like people who are off the grid don't need huge pensions, and I have the choice of adding to that pension with a private pension. But Sweden is different, so if you, even as a freelancer, if you work for companies in Sweden, or you have a job where you can just charge more, you'll be fine because you can make up for 
you know, the social securities that you have to pay. But I have this certain glass ceiling, I think they call it. Um, I can't charge more. I work for people in the UK and, you know, if I were to double my fee, then I simply wouldn't get any work. So I have to work more and that is a consideration. Obviously I knew about this before I came here and I decided to come anyways because it might turn out to be okay but it's it's definitely something to be aware of in Sweden specifically. For me this means I'm continuing to work as a freelance designer. Luckily because of the lockdowns my industry is more open to having short-term freelancers work remotely and this is how I make money these days. I usually find work through friends or recruiters and I hope this will be enough to get me the income I need. I've emptied my savings by now so I've been really careful with my spending. I've recently also taken on some work so that has kept me quite busy. I wish I had a brush. This is another way I've been saving money for the past years. I've been meaning to cut my hair for ages. I don't like the feeling of hair in my face. How short do I want it? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so much hair. Oh, there you go. I started making these YouTube videos to keep track of what I'm doing. I actually started making them as an extension of my website. I think it's nice to keep these memories. When I started doing these hikes, I realized that I was starting to forget <laughs> everything that happened which is why I started writing everything down and it gave me a purpose to use my writing and take pictures and then YouTube only happened because I started making my own backpacking gear and I realized how useful it was for me to actually see people make the gear then I realized I actually like editing and making videos and it's crazy that I make a little bit of money from it now as well and money-wise, it doesn't really make any sense to keep going because the time I spend making videos is... It's a full-time job, essentially. It takes me at least 24 hours to, to edit just the one video. The money I make currently is in a month <laughs> about the same I make in like three days working my normal job. So that's... That's a lot. And it's interesting how some people think that it's inspiring in some way because that wasn't my intention. Same with my website, hiking as a solo female. Not everybody does it. But I just, I don't see the difference between men doing things and women doing things. I mean, we've all got arms and legs. We can all learn skills. There's no. I don't really get it, but I guess that's different from other people. There you go. Saving money is easy. <gasps> that's actually not bad. So I guess that's my story. That's how I managed to live out in the forest and renovate this little house. I guess I'm just trying to make it work for every couple of months so that I can 
do these YouTube videos and to renovate the cabin I need to spend about a month doing a real a real job and that kind of gives me the bare minimum to keep going. I'll definitely be here for <laughs> the coming years to renovate this cabin. In the long term I have no idea. Maybe I'll stay or maybe I'll build a cabin in a different country somewhere. Anything could happen. The taxes do make it more difficult to stay here. Obviously I don't want to live a traditional life so I'm trying to have less of a traditional income so that makes it a little bit more challenging. It also makes it more difficult to save up for other things I might want to do. Yeah, we'll see how it pans out these coming years. Yeah. So this is my story. I hope it has given some insights for those of you who are interested in doing something similar. And if you like, you can keep on following my little journey here on this channel. 